Wesley had a calling. He visited Bath, for example, 80 times to preach to the ungodly gamblers who frequented the city. In 1809, Jane had obviously encountered the fervour of the evangelicals, as she says, I do not like evangelicals. But by 1814, she has mellowed somewhat, seeing their absolute faith as a safe and happy way to live. I am by no means convinced that we ought not all to be evangelicals, and am at least persuaded that they who are so far from reason and feeling must be happiest and safest. Just as Jane Austen gradually accepted this change in religious practice, so did the rest of society, and by the time Victoria came to the throne in 1837, the English church became a symbol of empire, and missionaries travelled far and wide to spread the message of salvation. The literature of the church was published, notably sermons which could be read out loud and discussed for moral guidance. Jane Austen mentions the sermons of Fordyce in Pride and Prejudice, but we suspect this has more to do with Lydia Languish in Sheridan's The Rivals, who curled her hair with papers made out of Fordyce's sermons than the moral words spoken by that gentleman himself. This would also suggest that religious literature was not the only writing which influenced the work of Jane Austen. As an author, Jane Austen's style had developed from extensive reading. She grew up with poetry and greatly admired it. Her mother was known to write witty verse, and Jane herself wrote lines to fortunate members of her family. The poetry which Jane would have been familiar with took two forms. Firstly, there was the formal classicism of poets like Dryden and Pope, and secondly, there was romanticism, which developed through the works of poets like Cowper and Crabbe, through to its full-blooded form with Wordsworth and Coleridge. Classical poetry was formal and precise, with conventional patterns for rhythm and rhyme, typically in the form of rhyming couplets. These are rhyming lines of equal length, coupled together. This classic example of a rhyming couplet comes from Alexander Pope's Rape of the Lock. Here files of pins extend their shining rows, Puffs, powders, patches, bibles, belay do. When the reader works it out, the sentiment is humorous, mixing up bibles with beauty spots and love letters. Jane Austen would have been used to deciphering classical poetry, but she also developed a taste for the work of poets who extolled the virtues of country life. In this letter, Jane describes her father reading the work of Cowper, a great favourite of hers. We drink tea at half after six. I'm afraid you will despise us. My father reads Cowper to us in the evening, to which I listen when I can. Cowper expressed the view that God made the countryside and man made the town. From what we know of Jane's thoughts on town life, she would have agreed with him wholeheartedly. Jane Austen left an interesting record of the poets and writers she admired in a very unusual place. While living at Steventon, where her father was the rector, she would take marriage certificates and fill them in, marrying herself to the men who appealed to her. George Crabbe seems to have been a favourite, and his poetry would have been in keeping with Jane's own tastes. He wrote closely observed realistic portraits of rural life. This observation of rural life was taken even further by the new romantic movement in poetry, which was challenging the classical formality of the past. William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge were the leaders of this new style. Both of them were born a few years before Jane, and just like Crabbe, they found their inspiration in nature. Their language may have been easier to understand, with a simple rustic quality, but surprisingly, Jane was not an admirer. Perhaps it was their moral conduct which put her off, because the story of Colonel Brandon's ward in Sense and Sensibility is not dissimilar to Wordsworth's own exploits with a young Parisian girl. The only time that Jane mentions Wordsworth is in her unfinished novel Sanditon, 
and as the character singing his praises is a complete idiot, we can only surmise that she was not a great fan. The Romantic movement was also influencing the world of painting, where portrait artists had been the great celebrities of the time. The rich who could afford the well-known artists to capture their likeness turned to Thomas Gainsborough and Sir Joshua Reynolds. Thomas and Catherine Knight, the wealthy relations who had adopted Jane's brother Edward, had their portraits painted by Romney, another well-known portrait painter of the day. Sir Joshua Reynolds did much for the development of art when he founded the Royal Academy in 1768. He hoped to copy the success of the French Academy, which had done much to improve artistic standards. Reynolds attempted to raise portraiture to a higher level, and he succeeded, using images inspired by classical mythology. The Royal Academy proved to be of great value to James Gilray and Thomas Rowlandson the two cartoonists we have featured in this video. The Academy taught young men of no fortune but great talent, giving them a chance to study with the best teachers. Both men fitted into this category, and the fact that 200 years on their work is still appreciated says much for the artistic ideals that Sir Joshua Reynolds instigated. A romantic movement was beginning to grow in the world of painting, with the work of Constable and Turner bringing about a change that would come too late for Jane Austen to see. Both were exact contemporaries of Jane, and she would have rather enjoyed their representations of ordinary country life rather than the fine but predictable ladies and gentlemen in blue silk and brown velvet of Gainsborough. Maybe if she'd seen Constable's work on this visit to a gallery, then she might have been a little more interested. Mary and I, after disposing of her father and mother, went to the Liverpool Museum and the British Gallery, and had some amusement at each. Though my preference for men and women always inclines me to attend more to the company than the sight. However, for Jane Austen, music was a much more fascinating branch of the arts than painting. She loved to play the piano for her own entertainment, sharing the distaste of some of her heroines for public performances. In this letter, she expresses her joy at having her own piano. Yes, we will have a pianoforte, as good a one as can be got for 30 guineas. And I will practice country dances that we may have some amusement for our nephews and nieces when we have the pleasure of their company. The formal music of Haydn, Handel and Bach would have been played by Jane. and She would also have played and sang the traditional songs which her reluctant heroines were forced to sing. But passion was on the way. Mozart, although formal and intricate in places, showed the first stirrings of passion, and Beethoven really gave full vent to his soul in the romantic spirit of the age. Music was changing to embrace the new century, moving on from the society which Jane Austen recorded so lovingly in her novels. The art of the popular novel flourished throughout Jane's lifetime. Her early preference for fielding Johnson and Richardson grew to include the works of Fanny Burney, the lady who experienced the horrific mastectomy we considered earlier. Fanny wrote about the entry of young women into society, with her best-known works being Evelina, Cecilia and Camilla. The title of Pride and Prejudice was, we suspect, taken from the closing chapter of Camilla. We can be pretty sure of this because the novel was published by subscription and the list of subscribers can be found in the book. One of the names on that list is that of Miss Jane Austen of Steventon. Despite Jane's great interest in poetry, novels and literature, she was not obsessed with books 
and in this reply to her friend Martha Lloyd, who has asked her to bring books on a forthcoming visit, she gives this forthright reply. You distress me cruelly by your request about books. I cannot think of any to bring with me, nor have I any idea of our wanting them. I come to be talked to, not to read or hear reading. I can do that at home. And indeed, I am now laying in a stock of intelligence to pour out on you as my share of the conversation. This explains why Jane Austen's novels paint such a vivid picture of her society. She watched, listened and recorded the trivialities of everyday life. Whether we look at the golden buildings of Bath, the stylish palaces of London, or the busy seaside at Brighton, it is easy to fill these places with Jane's characters, dancing, walking and cutting a dash when our imaginations have been fueled by her evocative chapters. Jane Austen achieved much in her short life, when we appreciate the legacy left in her novels and letters. She painted a picture of life as she lived it, and for many people, Elizabeth Bennet the heroine of Pride and Prejudice, with her fine eyes and sparkling wit, is the character who reveals the very essence of Jane Austen. Although many people of Jane Austen society read her words, few knew the identity of the lady who had written them. It is ironic, then, that 200 years later, present-day society knows all about Jane Austen, she would have been delighted if she'd known that the late 20th century perception of Regency society was based upon modern televisual and cinematic interpretations of her work and her six precious novels in all of their original glory. These lines from Elizabeth Bennet, if they truly do reflect Jane's own wishes, can now be recognised as an ambition fulfilled. I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak, unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity with all the eclat of a proverb. <laughs>